So let's quickly look at mathematical induction. So remember that mathematical induction is your proof technique that you have um, in order to prove statements that are asserted by natural numbers. For example, if you have a statement like, oh, if we add up all the odd numbers up to 2n minus 1, that will be equal to n squared for all integers n is greater or equal to 1. And the way that mathematical induction works, I really recommend you understand it. Don't just sort of rote learn or like blindly memorize the steps without understanding why it works. It basically, the rationale behind how it functions is it is sort of like a domino chain. I like to visualize dominoes. It works by proving that as if a statement is true, then it will be true for the one after it, plus creating a chain effect. So for, so if you can prove that as to, if true for a certain number, then the statement will be true for the next number. If you can just prove one base case, then by that sort of inductive logic, you'll be able to tip all those dominoes and then you'll be able to um, sort of prove it for all integers. So there are three main types of induction questions that we have in mathematical induction. We've got equality, we've got divisibility, and we also got inequality mathematical induction questions. And all three types were previously tested in the HSC for extension one. However, because um, of the new syllabus, you don't, you guys don't need to worry about inequality type induction questions anymore because Nessa was nice to you guys and moved them all to extension two because generally inequality ones were a bit harder than the other two types. Of course, if you do extension two, you still need to worry about inequality type induction questions, but if you just do extension one, you don't need to worry about them anymore and you just need to focus on equality and divisibility type induction questions. So there are four main steps of um, any mathematical induction proof. It doesn't matter if it's divisibility, inequality, or um, div if it, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's equality, divisibility, or inequality, but all of these four steps will stay true no matter um, what type of induction question you're doing. And the steps are that for the first step, you want to make sure you prove true for the first integer of the domain. So read the question. Usually this is n equals 1. However, sometimes it might start with a different integer. For example, I believe in one, in a past paper for extension 1, um, in the last few years, I think it was last year's paper maybe, I can't remember which one it was specifically, but it started with n equals 0 in that year. So you just want to make sure you read the question carefully. Um, then step 2, you want to assume that the statement will be true for some general number, some general term n equals k. And then for your first step, you want to prove true for the general term n equals k plus 1 using the assumption from part 2. So that's really important that you use the assumption because the whole basis of how induction works is that if true for a number, it will be true for the next number. So it sort of relies on the previous number being true. And then for your um, final step, you want to make sure you always remember to write a conclusion to sum up what is going on. So make sure you sort of um, finish your proof with a conclusion to wrap up your proof. So step one forms what we call the base element of the induction proof and steps two and three form what we call the inductive element. So the reason why it's important to have both steps is because it's kind of like dominoes. Steps two and three ensures that all the dominoes are lined up nicely. So it's saying that if the domino before it falls, then the, the next domino will fall as well. That's basically what steps two and three say, that if true for a number, it'll be true for the next number. So basically saying if one domino falls, it will tip over the next one. However, if you just have dominoes all lined up perfectly, that doesn't mean they fall yet. You need this first step, the base element. You need one domino to fall over to set off a chain reaction of the other dominoes falling as well. Because if you don't have that initial push, none of the dominoes will fall. So the steps one is making sure that what, at least one domino falls so that it will start, it will trigger this chain reaction and it will trigger, um, it will make the other dominoes fall as well. So you need both of them in order to satisfactorily 
prove something by mathematical induction. If you don't, you might end up with something called a false proof by mathematical induction, which is something the syllabus explicitly mentions you need to know about. Um, it's been added to the new syllabus and yeah, you've got to make sure you can identify errors in false proofs by induction. Um, so for example, if you have a proof that where steps two and three work out perfectly, but you haven't done step one, um, that might be a false proof. And the reason why this is the case, um, again, as I explained, without the inductive element, the statement isn't true for every integer in the domain. So the Domino's logic hasn't been used or can't be applied. So for example, with um, three and equals six, this statement isn't true for all integers n is greater or equal to two. It's only true for n equals two. So you haven't received, you haven't like sort of um, shown that there's an inductive element there. However, if you don't have the base element, what you've done is you've proven that the statement is true for an integer if it is true for the integer before it, but you don't have the initial first step to set off that chain reaction. So for example, you can prove something will be true for n equals two if it is true for n equals one, but if you haven't proven it's true for n equals one, then you haven't proven it's true for n equals two either. All you've proven here is that it will be true for n equals two if it's true for n equals one, but if you haven't proven it's true for n equals one, that means you haven't proven it. That means it won't be like you haven't shown it's true for n equals two because the whole truthfulness of n equals two is conditional on the fact that n equals one is true. So, so basically a too long didn't read, just make sure you don't be lazy and skip any steps. Make sure you include all the steps always um, in an induction proof um, to avoid a false proof by mathematical induction. So there's also another area in this topic which is quite controversial and that's sort of in step four about what sort of conclusion you should write. So we got short and long conclusions. So a short conclusion might be something like by the principle of mathematical induction, the statement is true or something like that. Whereas a long conclusion basically um, expresses what's going on in sort of full, a full um, like sort of explanation. So it's something like if the statement is true for n equals k, it will be true for n equals k plus one. Since it is true for n equals 1, it must be true for n equals 2 and n equals 3 and so on for all integers n is greater or equal to 1. So when I was in year 12, when I was in high school, my teachers only allowed us to write the long conclusion. They would not accept the short conclusion as well because they said that it didn't illustrate that we understood what was happening and why induction works. So we would be penalised if we didn't write the long conclu conclusion. So I always personally just wrote a long conclusion. However, if your teachers at school allow you to write the short conclusion, by all means, just you can do that. Just do what your teachers tell you to do because they're the ones marking your assessments. Um, and But I've also put this sort of table here about the pros and cons of the different types of conclusions and why you might want to choose doing a short conclusion or a long conclusion. conclusion. Um, but yeah, I personally always just wrote the long, the long conclusion and it's not too much longer to write. And also it does strengthen your proof because it helps shows the marker you understand what is going on. And it also helps you to remember the actual induction steps because it, it's all reiterated here in the conclusion. You've got your step two here with the assumption we have our step three here and we also have our base case here too. So, but yeah, it's up to you. Just make sure you're aware of what your school sort of um, your school's guidelines and sort of what they expect from you guys. So my tips for mathematical induction, make sure you always write a conclusion. Um, make sure you stick to the steps and work methodically. So keep in mind the four key steps and sort of follow that structure um, and illustrate that structure clearly to strengthen your proof. Make sure you always use the assumption in your third step that you make sure, yeah, make sure in step three, you always use the assumption that you made in step two. And when you're substituting values of K into N, make sure you're using brackets because a lot of the time um, errors can occur if you incorrectly substitute something into the statement. So make sure you're very careful when you're substituting numbers in. 
And at the beginning of step three, you should write down a RTP, which stands for required to prove, to keep yourself on track and remind yourself what you want your end result to be. So we'll see what I mean by RTP when we do a practice question together. And for divisibility type induction questions, make sure you explicitly state that you are working with integers. So let's try a question together now. So this question is an E4 level question, which is slightly harder than the standard ones you see um, in past HSC papers. Um, and you'll see why when we start doing it, because this industrial question sort of requires some creativity in terms of how you solve it. Um, but um, it's still an induction question and it still follows the, um, four the four main steps that we talked about earlier. So we're asked to prove by mathematical induction that 34n cubed plus 206n is divisible by 12 for all integers n is greater or equal to 1. So let's go ahead and do this question now. So I'm going to start off with my first step. Oops. So remember, your first step is to prove true for the first integer of the domain. In this case, we're asked for all integers n is greater or equal to 1. So therefore, I'm going to prove true for n equals 1. Like so. So I've proved true. Um, so that means I'm going to substitute 34 um, n equals 1 into the statement. So 34 times 1 cubed plus 206. 1 is going to be 34 plus 206, which will give me 240. When we add 34 to 206. So therefore, this is the same thing as 12 times 20. So therefore, it's going to be divisible by um, 12. So we can say therefore divisible by 12 and therefore true for n equals 1. Like so. So don't forget your base step. It's really important. Without it, your induction proof won't work because you need that initial push to set off the dominoes. Okay, so your second step is you want to assume true for n equals k. And remember, k is any integer that's greater or equal to 1. So we can just say k is just some general integer that's positive. So if you do extension 2, you might see this notation. This just means n is an element, is a member of the set of um, integers. So this fancy z just means integers the set of all integers. And when I put a little plus, it just means positive integers. But you can also write in words, k is positive integer or something like that. Um, but here, I'm just going to use this shorthand. So I'm going to say that um, 34k cubed plus 206k is equal to in order to express this as something divisible by 12, I'm going to write 12p. I can choose any letter I want, but the important thing is you can't forget this. You need to specify that p is an integer. Because if you don't, p could be a fraction and then this wouldn't be divisible by 12 anymore. So you can choose any letter you want. I'm going to use p and I'm going to say where p is an integer. Okay, so that was steps one and two. My third step is going to be proved true for n equals k plus one. So here's where I write my required to prove. So what am I trying to prove? I'm trying to show that 34 k plus one cubed plus um, 206 k plus one is and here's what i mean by putting it in brackets make sure you are careful when you're substituting um numbers into n um so this is going to be divisible by 12 so i'm going to say it's good i'm required to prove that this is going to be 12 times another letter 
because I already use P, I'm just going to use a different letter, and I'm also going to specify that Q is an integer. So now we can start forgetting on our left-hand side and trying to work our way to the right-hand side to show that it's equal to, it's divisible by 12. So I'm going to say on the left-hand side that this is 34, um, k plus 1 cubed plus 206 times k plus 1. And now I can expand the brackets. So you can use your year 11 knowledge of um, binomial expansion with Pascal's triangle to expand this. So this will be k cubed plus 3k squared plus 3k plus 1 plus um, 206k plus 206. So this is um, going to be when we we when we expand that's going to be um 34 k cubed plus 102 k squared plus 102 k plus 34 plus 206 k plus 206 so this is what we have on the left-hand side now. Remember, in our third step, we always want to make sure we're using our assumption somewhere. Um, so let's think, ask ourselves how we can use this assumption. So we know that 34k cubed plus 206k is 12p. So we have a 34k cubed here, and we also have a 206k here too. So what I'm going to... So because we assume this is true, we're going to assume this is going to be equal to 12 times some integer. So I'm going to replace it with that. So this is going to become 12p, these two times 34k cubed plus 206k, and then I have the rest of my expressions. So um, 102k squared plus 102k plus, um, so 102k squared plus 102k plus 34 plus 206, which is 240. Um, using assumption. So I like to write it to flag to the marker that I've used the assumption and show that where that result came from. So now what I can do is um, try to take out a 12 in front of all of these terms to see if it's divisible by um, 12. So what happens if I factorize out the 12? I'll get P plus 102 divided by 12 is going to be um, 8.5 or 17 over 2. K squared plus 17 over 2K plus um, 20. When I do 240 divided by 12, yep, 20 like that. So normally this, you'll be panicking and you'll be wondering, oh my gosh, something went wrong. Because usually here, this will all be nice integers and that's not a nice integer, that's a fraction. So you're probably panicking and you're like, oh my gosh, did we do something wrong here? And this is why this is an E4 level question. You have to be creative and think sort of carefully and outside the box. So in order for this to be divisible by 12, all of this stuff, all of these things inside the um, fraction, I mean, inside the brackets here, should it needs to be equal to Q, it needs to be some integer. So we know P is an integer, we know 20 is an integer, but 17 over 2 is not an integer. But what we notice here is that I can actually factorize out a 17 over 2K from both of these terms, and let's just see what happens. So if I take out a 17 over 2K, this will give me K plus 1, like that. So when I factorize it, this will be 17, to, 17 over 2, K times K plus 1 plus 20, like this. So now we need to do some justification and we're going to look carefully at what's going on. We know from step two that we said that k is an integer. So this is an integer and k plus one is also an integer. It's just going to be the consecutive integer after it. So we can say but what happens when we consider consecutive integers? For example, if k was like, I don't know, 3, 
the next integer will be 4. And if we multiply it, this will be 12, which is an even number. But if this was like, I don't know, um, t like 9, and this was 10, that would be 90, which is also divisible by 2. If this was like 6, and then that was 7, that would be 42, which is also divisible by 2. What's actually going on here is k can either be even or odd. So let's, if it's even, that means k plus 1 will be odd. But when you multiply an even number with an odd number, it will always be even. But if k was odd to begin with, if we add 1 to it, it will be even. And an odd number times an even number is also an even number. So no matter what, so no matter what happens, the product of two consecutive integers will always be even. And if it's even, it's divisible by two. So it will cancel out this two at the front and it will be a nice integer. So it's divisible by two. So the 17 over two, um, doesn't matter. It will still result in an integer. So we can say, K times K plus one is always even, but is even because product of consecutive of two consecutive integers is always even because odd times even is even and even times odd is even so you can justify that and because of that we know that um, we can say if I'm running out of space here, but we can just say therefore um, 17 over 2 times k times k plus 1 is an integer. Because if k times k plus 1 is always even, um, it's divisible by 2, so it will result nicely into... Um, an integer. So therefore, this thing is equal to 12q, where q is equal to um, p plus 17 over 2k times k plus 1 plus 20. Because p is an integer and k is an integer, all of that. So therefore, it's equal to the right-hand side. So then afterwards, you will um, have to write a conclusion. So for me, I would, um, I'll just write it here because um, I ran out of space over here. I'll just say, um, therefore, if true for n equals k, it will be true for n equals k plus 1. That's what we just did in steps 2 and 3. We basically said, assuming this is true, then this thing will also be true, and it did turn out to be true once we used the assumption. Um, but in step one, we showed that it was true for n equals one. So we can say, since the statement is true for n equals one, it will be true for n equals two and n equals three and so on for all integers n is greater or equal to 1. And there, tada, we just completed that mathematical induction proof. So yeah, you can see it's a bit harder than your usual ones. Not only did we have to use Pascal's triangle to expand that um, using your knowledge of binomial expansions, but also you had to think creatively here in order to illustrate why this thing is still an integer.